Okay, I, I passed one around already. Um, hi everyone, um, I am Jenny Liu from the Urban Studies and Planning School and um, I host this Friday seminar, Friday transportation seminar along with my colleague, uh, Dr. Figliosi back there. Um, today is the last day of, um, of the term, um, last seminar. And um, I just wanted to remind everyone that you are um, supposed to be turning in a reflective journal according to the syllabus and that's due by Tuesday of next week if you are taking this class for grade. Um, so for those of you who are in urban studies and planning sections, you can come and check uh, to see that your attendance and questions are recorded uh, appropriately um, after class if you want to take a look at that. Um, other than that, um, I am going to turn the floor over to uh, Dr. Clifton here to introduce our speaker today. Great. Thanks, Jenny. Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Clifton from Civil and Environmental Engineering, and it's my pleasure to introduce Philippe Mora. He's a, an associate professor at the Instituto Tecnico, or Superior Tecnico uh, at, in Lisbon. And I had the pleasure of working with him uh, a few years ago when I was on my sabbatical, and now he's on his sabbatical here on a Fulbright. Uh, and he's been doing a lot of work with walkability, and so it, it pairs very well with a lot of my pedestrian research here. Um, but I think the insights in what walkability means in another context, and particularly in a place like Lisbon, um, offers a lot of things to think about when you think about walkability here in the US and in the North American context. So, Philippe. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, thank you all for being here. So apparently this is the last class, so I'm, I'm doing the final here. So thanks to Kelly for hosting me over this year. It's uh, been to, to a very good experience. Um, and uh, I have this opportunity also to make this presentation, which is also good to talk about of some of, uh, of my work back in Lisbon. Uh, with uh, my research group. So it's walkability and walking in Lisbon, so I'll bring a bit of Lisbon with me to share with you today and so some of this work that we're doing. So I would like to acknowledge these two persons, Paul Camero, who is a PhD student, doing his uh, work on walkability in Lisbon, and Alexandre Gonçalves, who is a colleague of mine, faculty at IST. So uh, briefly, the outline, I, mean, I have a lot of... Uh, things here, but I'll try to go over them rather quickly, uh, making sure that you understand what I'm saying for sure. So Lisbon in a nutshell, a little comparison with, uh, with Portland, why studying walking and walkability. So this is the background part. I'll go really fast over this because I guess you all have heard about it. The IAP method, which is, well, the homologous uh, of a Pi model that Kelly developed with her team. Uh, why do he uh, do give so much importance to pedestrian networks in our case uh, than some case study results and mo more importantly the, the discussion of those results in terms of its validation. Having a, uh, a model is interesting but we should accept it and trust it. That's the issue. Some questions remain that I want to share with you and how technology might help. And I will just make a, mention a few words about this Volkbot project in the end. So Lisbon, well, Europe, Portugal, it has a metro area just like Portland. Uh, the reddish part is uh, the more densely occupied zone of the metro area of Lisbon. It has an history very large, much larger than the Willamette River, I can tell you. We have two bridges to cross it only. Uh, and then you have the more yellowish and greenish part that are the less densely occupied areas. So uh, that, that is where Lisbon stands, uh, that yellow part, and this is how it looks. So, um, well, I will make some comparisons of these, uh, some future statistics with Portland, just to give you an idea of the dimensions, okay? The scale, densities, climate, and so on. So um, this brings me to um, a little video that I prepared, uh, just to give you a feeling of how it is to be in Lisbon if you haven't been there, or recall it if you've been there. So I'll shut up for two minutes. <laughs> 
Well, I hope that uh, you can visit or even live uh, in Lisbon uh, after this small tourism walk. But the idea was to give you a feeling of how different, how diverse the walking environments can get in Lisbon. In the <clears throat> city center, you will get the old quarters, you will get the old neighborhoods, the older kind of urban planning style, very meshy kind of uh, street organization. and. Uh, in more recent urbanism, more lattice kind of network, perpendicular with parallel streets, but it's very diverse. And as you go out of the city core, then you will get more scarce uh, urban occupation. And with those bad examples that I cited, clearly car oriented and not walk oriented. So these uh, statistics give you a comparison of area. Uh, so I'll just talk about the metro area, because uh, uh, otherwise I would be spending too much time. So uh, as you can see, it's like more than five times the, uh, so Portland is five times bigger uh, area-wise than Lisbon, uh, but we have a higher occupation, a population density. So it's uh, the same population for five times bigger area, so it might make Lisbon five times dense dense uh, than, than Portland. And this has consequence on the, port, on the transportation system. Uh, if we look at the, the, the model shares here, and I will be comparing only with uh, metro areas, you can see that car commuters are 55% compared to uh, almost 80% to Portland. Uh, then, well, people are taking more transit in, in, in Lisbon metropolitan area and walking more but not cycling. Uh, so Rosa Felix, who is there, she will be soon, a few weeks from now, making some presentation about cycling in Lisbon, and she will talk about that and explain why we don't have at least 3% of uh, mobile chair. So then motorization rate, you guys have more cars per household, but not that different. And uh, regarding climate uh, indicators, like it's drier in Lisbon, uh, quite a lot, we know that, you guys know that, <laughs> I guess, uh, and it's warmer, and, but it can get really warm during the summer, so uh, you would think that it's drying is better for active modes, uh, but it's not very good in summer period because you don't like to be under the sun by then. Another interesting is the aging index, which is terrifying for Portugal because, uh, well, the index is three times bigger in Lisbon than here which means that either you guys don't have seniors or we're not making babies. So probably that's the second thing. Uh, and, uh, and that is worrisome in a city that is aging. Uh, and when you're doing urban planning for aging, if you don't care about walkability, you might, uh, well, 
prevent people from getting out uh, uh, of, of their houses. So why studying uh, walking and walkability? So this is the background. Well, walking is good, health-wise, social interaction, potentially uh, preventing people from using motorized vehicles. And this has a, sec a, a second wave of impacts uh, that you would kind of re resume it into social, environmental, and economic benefits. So I won't be spending more time on this. I guess you all guys know this. How walking and walkability is related. The literature is kind of stabilized regarding this, this issue. So we have on the blue boxes what relates to the individuals, lifestyles, preferences, well, everything that is behaviorally driving uh, behavior, sorry. And then uh, the, uh, the means of transportation that you have and how you consider them also, specifically those alternative modes, like for example, walking and cycling, will have to do with those individual traits. And then how the building environment is perceived. So perceptions are related to all these uh, characteristics of the person and uh, how people perceive those, that building environment varies a lot. And so it's how people perceive that makes the walkability so different from people to people and from uh, environment to environment. So we have these, we may postulate that perceptions of walkability are context specific because, well, the environment is different and the culture is different from place to place. People look at walkability differently in Lisbon than in Portland, for instance, from person to person. An aging person, a senior, will look at a built environment in a different way than uh, somebody who is an adult. And finally, one person may perceive walkability different, differently <coughs> depending on the treat motivation. For example, if I'm going for leisure, well, walking per se is what I want to do, and you want a nice walking environment that way. Or if you want to get to the end for a utilitarian trip, you might not really care about the way you're walking, you just want to get there. So this is why we have looked at walkability in a different perspective in a very detailed way. So this is a microanalysis of walkability that is our approach. So <clears throat> the ob objectives up front were to define a set of indicators to measure walkability. That's not nothing very new uh, in this, others have done that. Uh, Doing a detailed pedestrian network is something that not everyone relies upon uh, uh, and to make an operation tool for planning. So, and for planning at the smaller scale. So where to intervene to make in the urban environment more walkable? And we're talking about street segment wise. So why is it different? Well, because it's context specific. We calibrate the model for Lisbon or for a neighboring city. If you live in the, uh, in the southbound of Lisbon, you will look at walkability differently. So you should have a tool for that if you're doing microanalysis. Then it's participatory. The local authorities participate, stakeholders, representatives of seniors, of adults, parents of children, will give their perceptions on how, what is important in walking and how you should evaluate it. So that's why it's participatory. Then you have micro-scale analysis because it's based on the pedestrian network and it considers different population segments and treat motivations. And in the end, also validation. Can we accept our model? Uh, which is something that many models for walkability assessment don't do. And that's something that we should look at. So the YAPE method uh, is structured out seven Cs. The first five Cs originally were proposed by uh, Matt Horst et al. Uh, they talk about connectivity. It's like, can I have access to a formal pedestrian and get to my destination? Is it convenient? So does it like really provides me what I want? Can I get to the bakery? Can I get to the cinema? Can, uh, is it a nice experience? So is it comfortable? Is it convivial? Are there other people there or am I alone walking there? And finally, he, they propose conspicuousness. It, it has to do with environmental legibility, if I have the guidance, if I can orientate myself when I'm in some place in the, in the city. So we, we felt the need to add these two Cs, 
I mean, it's just not our print, fingerprint on this. Uh, so it's coexistence and commitment. Coexistence because we felt that, well, safety regarding other modes had to be there, uh, specifically, well, non-motorized modes like bikes or motorized modes like vehicles and whatsoever. So that was not existing there. And also commitment, which bring this policy dimension to the evaluation. I can tell you that when myself and my family came to Portland uh, in August, uh, we were really surprised that people would stop a few meters before the crosswalk when you just approach, approach the crosswalk. Don't do that in Lisbon, okay? So you should wait and see if people are going to stop. So this is what I mean here, uh, is like, is the community and the local authorities committed to making the environment more walkable? And this has to do with a lot of behavior and the compliance with regulations as well. So this is how the, we structured the thing. So we have three layers. So like the first layer was, has to do with preparing the model. The second one with processing, basically is calculation. And finally acceptance uh, is about validation. So the first thing that we uh, do, the colors don't have really a meaning here, don't, don't worry. So the first thing is, together with the local authorities and local planners, decide what is the case study that we want to tackle. Then, it could be a neighborhood, it could be streets, it could be the, well, a, a couple of neighborhoods. That is defined together with the stakeholders. And then we have focus group sessions so that we can structure the model. So for each of those dimensions, we will decide together which are the best indicators that mo better re represent and reveal the, the perceptions of those groups of population. So we do this together in focus, focus groups after uh, deciding uh, which are the indicators, we score them. So this is a multi-criteria analysis in an additive form, but we, were, we want to see if people weigh in the same way the different dimensions. For example, elderly might want to uh, give more importance to comfort and conviviality rather than, for example, I don't know, commitment, okay? So, and maybe parents of children are more worried about coexistence rather than connectivity when they are walking with their children. So this is weighting the different dimensions before we sum them is what makes the different perceptions of the walking environment come into play. Okay, so this was interesting to see that, well, our assumptions somehow uh, came to, to something very concrete. So after scoring it is, we have the calculation machine, we have to uh, collect data, measure the, the, the walking environment. So we assemble that into a GIS after having a pedestrian network pulled up and we make the calculation of the indicators. So in the end, we want to validate everything, so the yellow box, and for that, we rely on street surveys and pedestrian countings. And I'll talk about it later. So explaining it just a little bit more. So we have a set of seven dimensions. We get people in those focus groups and different representatives of each of these four groups. We could have set like I don't know, six, six groups. We could have divided seniors into more seniors, less seniors. We could have divided children into very young to just adolescents. I mean, we decided these ones to, 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 work, to have something to start with. Uh, so then we uh, decide on which are the key points and indicators for each of these dimensions. And this could be different for uh, seniors or for children, okay? So, and then the, 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 this is to illustrate the different weights. The boxes are bigger and smaller. For example, in this example, it's just fake. The key point B is more important than key point D in, in, this, in this case, okay? So just to say how you weight things, then you measure, you put numbers. It can, it can be qualitative or it can be quantitative, quantitative, sorry. And, and then you have to uh, normalize, standardize everything. So for that, you use value functions that can be linear, could be nonlinear, and I will also talk about this a bit later, uh, earlier. So this will bring every single dimension into the same scale of zero to 100 that is weighted, uh, and then you sum aggregate everything and get a walkability score. Okay, so this is how the tool works. Pretty stra straightforward, I guess. So I'll read very quickly on this, so just, just to illustrate how we did these focus groups. We have a first round for the structuration of the model. 
So basically, you have posters of, on the room with the, the suggestion of indicators that we pulled up from the uh, literature. More than 150 indicators for walkability is crazy. So we select some of them and people would choose which one they perceive has been the better representative of their perception, okay? So for connectivity, you would choose, for example, the number of nodes in the network or uh, uh, with, with the sidewalks, how far can I get? How many destinations can I access? So this is, for example, how people would choose from a set of different proposals. So with that, each group of, of, uh, of pedestrians that we got represented here uh, ended up choosing a set of 17 key points and indicators. So this is what we were going to work on. And based on them, then we would have a second round. So we would gather these groups separately, each one with a mediator. And the mediator would ask pairs of questions. So we would have two settings of options. Would you prefer to walk? on a very connected network, but that is not very comfortable, or in a, non in a very comfortable network, but is not very connected. And so people would discuss among those four people that we gathered around the table, four representatives of adults, four representatives of seniors, and so on, and they would get to a consensus each time a set was asked. And they would have to decide which one they would get. So this is an experiment that lasts for one hour and a half. So people would have to be very patient, but we got uh, interesting, um, interesting results. So if we look at the, how adults weighted differently leisure trips or utilitarian trips, we can see that, for example, uh, commitment, uh, coexistence, comfort, and connectivity were more important when they're walking for reaching the destination only. And conversely, they were less important con conspicuousness, conviviality, and convenience that were more important when walking for leisure. So these kind of came to prove, or according to our expectations, that people different see walkability differently when they are uh, doing a leisure trip or a utilitarian trip. Now, if we look at uh, utilitarian trips, but now for different groups of pedestrians, we can see, for example, that some of the dimension are pretty much the same, like coexistence or even comfort is like the most elected uh, dimension. So that's what people value the most in, in, in walkability for our experiment. But other dimensions like conspicuousness or even conviviality, it's very diversified from people to people. So conspicuousness while impaired people and seniors clearly uh, underweighted those compared to other uh, dimensions. So these uh, postulate that people have different perceptions, perceptions of walkability also got to be then confirmed here. So now that we have the model built, we have it scored, now we have to measure things and collect data into a GIS database. For that, we have to get the attributes of each segment of our network. And for that, we need a pedestrian network. So planning uses a lot of this walking distance to decide where land use should be. For example, this is uh, the case of Portuguese standards for a location of public facilities, in this case, schools, sports playgrounds, and high schools. And it says that, well, from any place, you shouldn't walk more than 15 minutes or one kilometer to get to an elementary school. And the same thing for sports, playground, and so on. So see, this is how you plan a city, which makes totally sense. But what maybe people are doing is that they are having these buffers around. And so what I want to illustrate here is the importance of, consider, of considering actual networks and how that is totally different. So this is a, just uh, an, an, an exercise that we did for five locations in Lisbon and have different uh, uh, morphologies, so and topologies. So this part here, this down here closer to the river is more hilly and here is more like level terrain. So you would say that up there it's more walkable a priori 
uh, than in, in, in the southern area. So, but what I want to call your attention is this buffer of this yellow circle that is like flight bird kind of distance. And here is using the road center lines. It's like if people would walk where cars drive, this is how you read it. And this is what many models do actually. Uh, and, and as you can see, even using the road center line, the car shed is uh, smaller than actually uh, the five minutes buffer, but in some points you can even reach out, like here. Uh, when you're talking about the pedestrian network, it's much smaller. And so if you would look at these, uh, like zero being your origin, where you're living your trip, and 100 is your destination, within a five minutes buffer walk, that's yellow circle, then you would say that with the road center line, you could, instead of that, reach 50% of the area, and with the detailed pedestrian network, and if you would consider instead of length, actual time of walking, then you would get 30%. So really, planning should consider uh, pedestrian networks if they want really people to reach out those equipments and those facilities as they are planning. More importantly even is if you add the quality. So up to here, we're just uh, talking about attributes of distance and time. If you add the, the attractiveness dimensions of walkability, it's like it becomes much smaller, especially for impaired people that where you have cutoffs. If you have a sidewalk that doesn't have the appropriate curve for wheelchairs, I mean, it's kind of an island. And so the, the pet shed for impaired people is much smaller than the ones that I'm showing here. So, and I'm going to illustrate that with some case studies. So uh, we looked at Lisbon only, although we ha here I'm presenting Lisbon only, we looked at another municipality in the southbound of the River Tagus uh, that is very different urban planning. Uh, but uh, just to say that results really differ from place to place, even within Lisbon. So here is those southern areas, more hilly and old quarters of Lisbon, where you have this kind of street, uh, very disorganized kind of uh, streets. You know, you don't have those blocks like you guys have here in, uh, in the US. And, and, and this is hilly, uh, believe me. So uh, what you get here is the 300 meters radius and the, the pet shed. Uh, like I showed before. And in this case, well, you, you still have pretty much connectivity, okay? So you, you, you can walk uh, to up 60% of the five uh, minutes walk radius. But now if you look at the quality of that pedestrian environment, it's not only where to get, is if it's a good experience or not, and if, if it can prevent you to do it. So we have these two schools that we uh, looked at, uh, and, and as you can see, uh, there's a scale of colors, the heat map that other models do as well, uh, where the red is very bad and the green is very good. And we divide it in five categories, pretty much like the levels of service of the highway capacity manual. A is very good, E is very bad. And uh, if you look at these tables that you have down here, uh, then you can, uh, quantify a bit how bad this can be. So if you look at school A, well, you can say that only 40% is really bad. We're talking about classes E and D. But if you look at school B, you can see that only 25% of the network has an acceptable walkability level above uh, uh, 40%. And so, and this is, was measured because these are schools for children. That's why I had the circle there. So the calibration is for children. If I would have the impaired mobility, it would be different. But if you want to promote pe children to go to school walking, I mean, so you have to do something here, clearly, as a planner. So uh, then uh, getting to a different setting, the upper uh, districts that I was talking earlier. So this is level terrain. It's not hilly. So a priori, it's a nice place to walk. And the urban planning is more recent. You have wider sidewalks, and you would think, like, well, these green uh, lines here indicate, well, this is a nice place to walk. But if you are an adult, if you are a senior, it's not so bad, but it's beginning to be more yellowish, and some reds come up. 
and if you are an impaired person, you're in trouble. Why? Because although it's pretty walkable, but sidewalks are walk, there's a lot of obstacles there and a lot of um, sidewalks that don't have curbs prepared for wheelchairs. So clearly, uh, this is not a very interesting place for impaired people to walk. So the bottom line is, decent pedestrians, different quality needs, different factors are valued differently, and the same urban environment can really have different walkability scores depending on the type of person and the type of trip that you're making. So, <clears throat> validation issues. So we got a nice model, we can evaluate things, now, can we trust it? Does it mean anything to us? And can we use it for planning? So coming back to uh, the structure of our model, well, the first question was, what do we want to validate here? So which part do we want to validate? And we come up with a lot of different sources and types of uncertainty, and this can really get very messy. So when you trust, start worrying about how trustful your model is. <laughs> so there are types of data collection and input uncertainty, is making errors of measurement, this kind of stuff, or inserting the results of your collection into a database, you make mistakes. Then you have methodological uncertainty, is, well, did we make the, choose the right methods did we implement correctly our tools? Then calibration uncertainty. And here I'm speci uh, talking specifically about the scoring part. Uh, we used some methods to have this multi-criteria weighting process done, but what if you would have chosen another one? There are several. Can we trust this? And finally, the model specification. So, for example, for the value functions, I'm considering that I should standardize with the linear relationship, but maybe that's not the case. Maybe it's a discrete function. I will talk about this later. And this could have a huge impact on the results in the end. So we're doing some work on that, but here uh, I will concentrate on the validation part that the, regards the final walk capability scores that we got. So then the next question is not what we want to validate, is how. So for, for this, we went through the literature and we, well, it does not many examples of walkability assessment models that are doing validation. And the approaches of validation are very different, the way that people confirm their results. So these are the four ones that we grouped into these categories. Uh, so we have pedestrian counts, but there's a big assumption here is like, you're just saying that you can, you can say that your walkabilities are good if you have more people walking there. So it means that, uh, and, and not the other way around, that you could think like uh, Jaime is doing, is that you could uh, predict more people walking with your walkability. So I, I have some doubts regarding this that I will share with you. Then the street surveys. So what you do with street surveys is, for example, you have evaluated this walkability score, this walkability score of the 4th Avenue, then you go to the 4th Avenue and make intercept interviews on the street and you ask people what is their perception of the walkability of that. So what we did is uh, just ask the person if they were used to walk around in the neighborhood and ask them, compared to that street, what was the worst and the better street that they knew and that they could refer. And so this is how we had examples from the perception of people, how they value high or low walkability directly. Uh, you have to make a lot of questions to get a good variety of results. Uh, we did 400 uh, uh, intercept street surveys. Then we had, we had home-based surveys, another 400, and this is more the, the standard mobility surveys where you go to the household of people and ask them uh, what are the usual routes that they use to walk to go to nearby shops, to the next interface, to the next bus stop. So what are the streets they use? And so we piled up all, compiled everything, so, and you could see if people were choosing the more walkable streets. And that was the assumption. Again, if we assume that the, if they choose that route is because they value that and they give it more walkability score. And uh, then we would see if our measures would match the perception of people. 
what we saw in the literature as well is that the consist how to validate models is see if they are consistent with other models. And this very successful one, commercially at least, is walk score that you have in the internet, uh, is one of the that is mostly used. Although I would be rather uh, avoiding that, calibrating my model with someone else's model. Okay, so. Uh, both have assumptions are prone to being uh, wrong. So this is the first results regarding this first group, the pedestrian counts, and the assumption that more pedestrians is more walkable uh, environment. So we audited uh, 2,600 street segments. Uh, then we sampled out 60 street segments for validation where we made 10,000 counts. So we did counts over a week six days from Monday to Saturday and for each day we count made five countings morning peak afternoon peak the lunch peak and in between those three so we came up with uh, this kind of results and I guess this rings a bell uh, at least to Jaime and Kelly uh, so the, the difference is that what we do in well we have walkability scores no pie levels and in the uh, y-axis we have pedestrian flows and not uh, uh, walk uh, shares, okay? So this is for each street segment. If I would compare with the pie model, they would have uh, walk share and uh, pie levels for zones, okay? So a bunch of street segments. But the first conclusion is, as from 50% of walkability, it starts ramping up. You have more people deciding to choose those street segments to walk. But you have outliers, and um, so this was, uh, I'm quoting Paul Kembra, the PhD student that I mentioned, he was the one to have this idea uh, that outliers could be our friends if we look closely uh, to them. And so that's what we did, and uh, instead of trying to get a better fit of the model. So by the way, the fit was not so bad, it was 40, the R square, we were rating worse than that. But if you would take off the, uh, these outliers, just like that, you could go up to 70% or more. So then we looked at the upper th threshold uh, values. And these are two of the streets that we were looking at. So this one is near those schools that I mentioned, the Hilly Park, Old Quarters. The streets are not very walkable, as you can see. And this is, also, is in the other place, which is uh, uh, the uh, more walkable zone that I mentioned earlier on, that is undergoing big retrofit. So there was a big intervention and they renewed it a lot. So we have the chance to have data before the intervention and data after the intervention. And Paulo is actually working on that on his PhD. Uh, and to get to this, uh, eventually to this conclusion, it's not only uh, uh, if you build it, they will come and walk, is if you build it, is who will come and will they like it, uh, which is another dimension of walkability. So um, what we can see here is that with those guys, they walk, but they are below their expectations in terms of the quality of the walking environment. So what do you do if, if you improve that, you would expect those dots go rightwards and eventually make a better model fit. On the other hand, if you look at below the threshold, the average that you would expect, there's some nice walkable streets, but they're not being walked on, even if you have these multi-story, multi-family buildings. So people are not walking there, why? And we, we looked at the connectivity, so with which segments these are connected with, and in fact, these are islands of walkability. And from an urban planning, it doesn't work because it's like if you were going to an abyss of walkability when you reach the end of the street. So clearly, uh, if you don't do nothing, you could have like this degradation. People are not walking. So if the people are not walking, I won't do anything. And eventually those dots will go leftwards to where they should be according to our curve. Or you do something to improve the walkability as a network and not only has a strict segment. So moving on, you want not to get a better model fit necessarily, you want to look at why it doesn't follow the pattern that you would expect 
and for that it might help you to do planning as well by spotting where what are the outliers what is wrong there so this is Jaime's uh, paper at TRB a few weeks ago he was talking about this it just to show that remind you that we have the 50 percent uh, threshold and the question that comes to my mind is could we benchmark walkability for urban map planning so what would be a benchmark 75 60 percent so is this does this make any sense in the assumption that if you are above those planning design indexes maybe you would get more walkable because what we have in lisbon for example is the same new neighborhoods were built according to the same regulation and one is walkable and the one was is not so clearly there's a dimension of walkability missing in those urban planning indexes so this might help so coming to the next uh, tool for validation was the street uh, surveys where we would ask people directly what is their perception regarding the the walkability that of the street they're using and uh, so this is, is like those confusion matrices that you have on the lines you have the measured walkability with our tool and in the columns you would account for what people perceive as being high or low walkability so the green squares just say for different groups adults and seniors that well the low the, the good the high high pairs are good we could match 80 percent of the streets that are good as we measure and as people perceive well not so big in senior but still 70 percent of the cases which was very good but if you look at the low low it was terrible <laughs> i mean clearly uh, we were measuring stuff as low and people were not saying that it was that bad for them so this was a big disappointment for us at first but then we understood what was the problem is that our tool <laughs> scans everything to the single detail you know that that end alley that nobody wants to go and even knows our model measures but people when you ask them they don't know that so the problem is the way that we made the questions we should and we corrected that in the new survey that we did and it works more so you have to show people pictures which per se is also an issue because if you show a street with the sunlight it's going to be differently perceived with the 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 the, the, the rain right so but this was better we got better matches there showing what is a bad street in in that neighborhood compared to what is good and ask people to place that street where they're walking in that scale so this is how we validated our tool and i still have uh, one or two minutes the questions that remain uh, well the, the value functions so this is what we kind of are starting to agree with more walkability more people has from 50% it, it ramps up so the question is and what after that does it like always get asymptotically to the 100% walkability or would that be the case like after some critical thresholds the walkability gets wrong and this is now especially especially true in Lisbon because we have hordes of tourists walking around and it can really get bad so when you have millions of people walking around can you say that is walkable so what worries me is are, are we capturing this feature now or should we work on this so I thought in our case for uh, IAPE is this would be the value function so how we do we capture uh, people walking in our model is with a kind of ideality it's like are the people using the same street that i am which is good but maybe just up to a certain extent that is the critical threshold and you would like monotonically uh, increase the index that you will add to your walkability score but after some point maybe capacity uh, would it be the right threshold then you would go down and it would be decreasing the importance of that conviviality uh, dimension to the final walkability score so this is something that we have to work on and the calibration of these functions is the very detail of walkability analysis but it can be really uh, impactful in your results so other questions 
how to avoid sources of uncertainty, how much walkable is enough when doing planning, I already mentioned that. Can we use walkability scores to predict demand? So I hope Jaime and Kelly will have some answers soon. Uh, uh, another thing is for the modeling of networks, if I have an OD matrix of pedestrian flows, can I do assignment using walkability as an impedance function? Is that, we didn't try that. Uh, I don't know if Kelly, you, you did try that or not. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, then uh, what about commutative impedance? It's like when, you, when you're driving a car, you don't get tired. I mean, your car doesn't get tired. But if you're walking, uh, by after 15 minutes walking, you might perceive walkability difference. So can you have a dynamic uh, impedance function of walkability? So these are a few questions that uh, kind of go to my head, come to my head. So finally, and uh, this is just a couple of technology stuff, this is the WalkBot project. So I'll skip that. The idea is to have a scanner of the street, okay, something that is walking on the sidewalks and measure stuff. So we're doing this with the Talos. So this was an award that we got for this context, the contest, the Talos Innovation Challenge. For those who don't know, Talos is a big tech company, uh, military stuff included in France, and they're turning to mobility now. And so this is a team that we gathered guys from robotics, and those, they are the ones who, who made the gadget. So they put into a box sensors a lot of technology, imagery recognition uh, scanners, 3D scanners, GPS, inertia measuring units, and blah, blah, blah. So you put that on a vehicle, it could be a Segway, a cart, whatever you want. Uh, there are stability issues for the imagery. Uh, and then we come, so this is the robotics part, and we come with, okay, what do you want that for? <laughs> and we tell what to measure, how to measure, and where to measure, okay? And also when. Uh, so these are first results that we got. Uh, so this is an image, an image, and from that we do a 3D, uh, 3D uh, model with a lot of dots, and then you can measure. So this is the distance, the effective width of the uh, uh, sidewalk <coughs> with uh, a lot of uh, precision. By the way, we don't need that much. <laughs> People don't think like that. Uh, and the risk of slipping, for example, that was enough. So they can, uh, you know, this is the cobbled stones uh, sidewalks in Lisbon. It's a lot of small stones, very regular, and it can measure bumps of that size. It's like something one inch high. Uh, and so for that, you can also scan the granularity of the pavement, which is very important for pavement and avoiding slipping. Okay, so. This, uh, this is really um, interesting stuff. And uh, this is how it should work in the end. So the walk bot is walking on the sidewalks and is automatically making the 3D uh, dimensional uh, model of what he's uh, measuring every second. And from those uh, the 3D models, we can calculate the walkability indicator. So this is up to what we got in the last six months. Now we're gonna work on, okay, so how do we make calculation of walkability indexes? But it's kind of exciting to see that we could eventually substitute those street audits, or at least part of it, with this kind of tool. So uh, this is how it would work. So we would have, we would resort to some crowdsourcing stuff, like putting police officers with their segways that they do that in Lisbon. They would have a walk bot, and as they are doing their stuff, they would be measuring, you know, continuously, and then uh, having the postal services doing that as well. Uh, we get some kind of an agreement. That's how our box, and who knows, making an automated vehicle. <laughs> and it would kind of scan all the time uh, street networks, which in some streets in Lisbon would be kind of a problem, because I can tell it can get really messy. So this is what I had to talk to you. Sorry to get so late to the 15 minutes. Thank you so much, and I'll be happy to discuss this with you guys.
It's a question. Oh. Well, at least you didn't fall asleep. Yeah. You had music. <laughs> <laughs> when you look at the walkability indicators and kind of being able to score, particularly the neighborhoods, uh, you know, schools for children, what do you think is the most valuable thing that planners can take from that as they're looking to you know, changing or upgrading any of those uh, pedestrian pathways? So yeah, that's that's what are these tools uh, help? How are these tools helping us for planning? So that's that's the measures. So you're not asking the how; you're asking what for, right? So uh, I guess that, firstly, it's, it's, it's very different uh, from city to city. The way that uh, culturally people are having their children in Portugal walking to school is not the same here. For example, we don't have school buses, for instance. We don't have that. Uh, so pretty much, uh, uh, so I, I would say that you could use this to at least spot if there are any dead ends, walkability-wise. And, and uh, I would kind of think that you should build kind of corridors for children that you don't have to make it everything very walkable, but at, at least make a hierarchy of where you would have uh, places more dedicated to children's walking. And I'm thinking, for example, for those penny bus initiatives where parents get together and once in a time they just walk a bunch of kids to school. Well, maybe that could be the avenue for children to walk, and this kind of tool can help decide where it would be most effective uh, uh, in order to outreach those buffers of uh, five minutes walk or one kilometer walk uh, in the neighborhood. Oh, no problem. Yeah. I have a question from online. Um, uh, Marcio asks, in your opinion, what is the most notable difference between walkability in Lisbon versus Portland? Okay, so thank you, Marcio. Uh, well, I'll start with my own experience, right? Uh, has been here for a year, and uh, I can tell that it's uh, it's, it's a lot easier, physically speaking, to walk in, in Portland because it's not so, uh, I'd say, you don't have so many hills than we have in Lisbon. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing that you, it's very walkable because you have a lot of wide sidewalks here, although the distances are much bigger. So uh, the decision on whether to walk or not is not because it's more walkable, per se, it's whether I will spend half an hour to get to the end of my, de to the end of my destination, which wouldn't happen most of the cases in Lisbon, I guess. Uh, now, from a, a more kind of technical perspective, I would say that uh, the results of applying, and I haven't done that, I, I should do that, <laughs> apply the model here in, in, in Portland, is that I guess that in Lisbon you will get much more diversified settings of, of walkability. Uh, maybe within the same neighborhood it's much less uh, stable uh, when compared to here. So clearly doing the zoning, zonal approach that Kelly and Jaime are doing makes a lot of sense to me because within the same zone I guess there's not so much variety. Uh, but if you would do that in Lisbon, you should have very, very small, small zones because you have these very diverse sets of walk, walking streets. So I would say that these are the two main uh, answers I could give to that question. Yeah, I guess I would say <clears throat> there's two aspects. So one is the physical infrastructure and then the other is the accessibility. Yeah. And so uh, Lisbon clearly wins on local accessibility because you have a coffee shop on every corner, you have restaurants very close. And in that regard, in Portland, we have much more variability in a neighborhood depending on how close you live to the commercial district. So, uh, but our infrastructure is much more uh, straightforward. Uh, so less, less variability across the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, Kelly, you, you were in Lisbon. You know how it goes. Uh, and and even uh, 
one one criticism, for example, that I have, and it also comes to to how context specific these tools can be. Uh, if you look at the walk score uh, tool that you can reach online, uh, and it's 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 very powerful. So basically, what they do is they rely on uh, distance to shops and the number of shops that you can walk to. They use the row center line and Google stuff, and they pull up some indicators. I don't want to uh, undervalue, but but clearly in Lisbon, uh, you will get scores in the city center between 95 and 98 on a scale of zero to 11. So yeah. you can see really make differences in Lisbon using walk score, but that happens here because it makes total sense. You guys have like the main streets here where all the shops concentrate. And if you walk two walks away from that, then there's no really places places to go besides where you live or some uh, you know playgrounds stuff like that. So uh, it was conceived by Americans for America or for urban planning like you do in America, but for European cities, it's very different, and you don't get the details that you need that you need for walkability. It was conceived mostly to sell real estate. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> it was. <laughs> and they were success, success, uh, successful to that end. I mean, it's working very well. I looked at it when I came here, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the video. Yeah. We may request all the visit in the video. Yeah. I level of the Yeah, sure. I, I was just wondering, um, you know, I think you focused a lot on the sidewalk. And, you know, I think from um, looking at from the safety perspective, a lot of the problems are on the cross, you know, when you cross the streets and it's different if you have like a, you know, signal versus a mark crosswalk and mark and, and so on. And I, I'm just trying to understand how in, in your model, how this difference is in terms of these kind of points that it seems crucial in terms of safety. You know, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that question. I, I didn't go over that because otherwise it would be two hours. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to hear me during two hours. Uh, but uh, so for that, to get that level of detail, that's why it's so important to have a very detailed pedestrian uh, uh, network. So we have, when building the network per se, we have 17 different typologies of uh, links. Uh, and uh, each one of them will have different attributes on it. And, and uh, we had the first doubt that we came across is, okay, so we have two intersections and you have a segment between them and you have two sidewalks, for example. So where do we make the crossing? Is this, we, do we consider only the formal crosswalks or should we consider the kind of desire lines where you just cross the street in the middle of the segment. So we had to come up with all these details and that would uh, allow us to at least uh, compare it to our to, to, to safety uh, numbers. So we just had a, a master student doing that, some autocorrelation stuff, and uh, we, can, we made a, a frequency model to estimate the number of uh, runovers across crosswalks based on uh, including the walkability dimensions that we used with calculating with IAPE. So the, the, the awkward result that we got is that the more walkable, the more accidents you get. <laughs> Which afterwards make total sense because, and the conclusion was, well, you have more people walking, you're more exposed. And the thing is, if you have a plan, as a planner, design for walking, you have also to design to prevent road speed and big capacity in in the in the road uh, pavement well in the, where cars drive so that's that's what explained and was the main conclusion it was like an eye opener but quite obvious i would say but so these kind of walkability tools can bring the dimension of how people perceive and behave on the sidewalks and how can that can uh, and thoughtfully expose them to some danger if there is a lot of traffic there. Okay, so I don't know if I, I somehow answered to your uh, question. Yeah. So when you did these kind of studies and talk to people, is 
a lot of way to, to this kind of you know just intersection, just the, the crossings of more weight yeah. on the sidewalk person. Uh, so that just maybe an what people people were worried about two uh, safety issues, which, which was safety with other modes and safety of falling, especially the seniors. Uh, we have very very bad quality pavement in many places in Lisbon because of the cobblestones. Uh, so regarding the crosswalks, we had one specific indicator that was chosen by uh, the people. So not only seniors, but also the representatives of children, which was how safe was the crosswalk. And from that, we went to the literature and see how you can measure. So basically it was the visibility distance, how many lanes you had to cross, and if the cars would see you as well. So that was the three dimensions that we combined to measure that co uh, the coexistence issue of our model. I think yeah. there's a, an issue thinking about the transferability of the results, not just in terms of the built environment, but um, how these different cohorts might evaluate these attributes in the US versus mm -hmm. in Lisbon. So uh, I lived at the very top of one of these hills and uh, going from the bottom to the top, often these little old ladies were lapping me very quickly. Uh, so, so thinking about how um, these groups who have walked their whole lives in these environments, and walked their whole lives in Portland environment or not, you know, how these things might be culturally transferable, I think is another interesting aspect of this. Yeah, thing. absolutely. So, uh, but that's why uh, I, I wouldn't use these weights in Lisbon anywhere else and that's why uh, we call it participatory and, and, and well one of the ideas of me coming here was actually doing that but I would have to involve local municipalities 20 people willing to participate in the focus groups and eventually come up with how they would weight these dimensions which well if somebody wants to help me with that it's fine <laughs> there's, there's still a few months uh, ahead uh, before I go back to Portugal, so yeah. So if there are not any further questions, with three minutes past, uh, any questions? No. Oh, oh, please. Well, sure. I um, work four hours a week. I here I have a vision impairment. Here we call it legally blind. It means that I have vision for my life, but not enough to drive. A car, but you know, I walk around and take the streetcar and pretty much go where I want. Um, so, speaking for myself, I I could do something in three months if you, oh, if thank you, you. need me. Yes, I have a totally blind homeless friend now who uh, gets hit by cars, and when we walk together, uh, well, I I yell at the cars because. Our traffic laws are, well, I grew up in New York and it was, it's crazy to say it, but the streets were safer. They're allowed to turn right on a red light. Yeah. There's something with the cars are allowed to walk, go while we're walking and it doesn't work for us. But yeah, sure. Anyway, I'll talk to you after the... Well, thank you. Uh -huh. I think I'll be able to reach you. If I that is pulled up. Thank you. Okay, well, okay. Thank you, Philip. Um, <laughs> <laughs>